Pardon the interruption, I'm Chris Garrett. Sam, July 21st is National Junk Food Day. Do you have a dream junk food? It's right here, Chris. I call it the Frugier Twinix. It's a Twix bar wrapped in a Twinkie, topped with beef jerky, wrapped in an orange cherry fruit roll-up. You're, you're not going to eat that thing, are you? That's disgusting. Not bad. <laughs> that savory sweet thing. Is that it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> the beef jerky comes on late. It's a late charging taste. <laughs>welcome to pti boys and girls i'm sam mulberry chris are you right there i'm i'm doing okay it was actually it was actually quite good I, 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 <laughs> he's not kidding <laughs> yeah I, I like that i'm, I'm gonna probably eat the rest of that later yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> so um we our discussion post for last time actually was i think a really interesting question we got some interesting responses from students and it had to do with how modern christians can learn from medieval christians mm -hmm. so i mean as you read some of the responses or the things that jumped out at you yeah, I mean, actually, one, I think we both got, that you had mentioned, is the appeal of monasticism. This, this sometimes has come across, when we've taught like Benedict in small groups, but not always. So I was struck that without a lot of prompting, students turn to that. It, I'm struck partly because there's actually something floating out there in the kind of blogosphere called the Benedict Option. This, this mostly comes, I think, from conservative Christians who... Um, feel a little bit like the culture is secularizing too much, and so they they they, they followed this philosopher named Alistair McIntyre, and they appeal to well, Benedict retreated from culture and built a different kind of community. So I mean, if you reacted that way, you know that's that's not an unusual response. That, that there is something attractive about an intentional community that's got some degree of discipline that that's built on this really strong faith foundation. So I, it wasn't surprising, except to the extent to which most students wrote about it. Did, I mean, did that come across with your group? Absolutely, yeah. And it was interesting. I mean, what I hinted or what I noticed was sort of hints of there's something about monasticism that's really interesting, but at the same time, I, I sort of reject some of the principles of it. Yeah. Uh, so I heard students saying that. And uh, what I find interesting, and this is something that I've thought more about in the last couple of years is, over the course of this class, we encounter a number of monastics. So we start with Anthony, right? And Anthony is responding to the Constantinian church in lots of ways, the worldly church and getting away. Benedict is responding to um, the fall of the empire and like how do you get some sort of order and stability in a time of chaos, right? Yep. Francis is responding to prosperity of the high middle ages. Yep. And then we'll see, um, uh, you know, and you, you see, looking at the Reformation, you see um, Ignatius Loyola, who's responding to the Protestant Reformation, yeah. expanding to global expansion. Yeah. And so this, so this made me think, and I wrote this to a couple students who wrote about monasticism, is I think every age gets the monasticism it deserves mm -hmm. or it needs. And, and, you know, part of, you know, Francis, during Francis's time, the monasticism of Benedict didn't quite fit. Mm -hmm. And definitely Anthony didn't fit during the time of Benedict. What do you can't reject the empire if the empire's crumbling, yeah, right? Exactly. So so then that led me to think like what is the monasticism of the 21st century? Like what is the monasticism our time and our context needs? Well, I, I mean I, I think at least one of my students did talk about Pope Francis here, which you know the choice of name obviously evokes Francis of Assisi, but also is Francis Xavier, the Jesuit missionary that we we've talked about and of course the Pope himself is a Jesuit. I, so I don't know if he's giving a kind of monasticism. It's not new, right? In many ways, it's a very Jesuit mm -hmm. nation. You know, it's in the world. It's not separated, but it's very active. It's got this deep-seated kind of humility and compassion, uh, desire for social justice. You know, that seems to speak across a lot of Christian divides. Whereas I, I do think Benedict with some of my students more than others, ran into their deep-seated Protestant suspicion of works righteousness. That mm -hmm. he says you've got to do this striving towards doing good works in order to enter the kingdom. That, I mean, in a post-Reformation, if you're a Protestant, that, that, that that's a big red flag, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the second big issue that came up was the notion of Christendom. And some, I mean, I think a real divide among my students there. Some really were attracted to this notion of a deeply Christian kind of society. Others really were worried about, well, but what does that mean for separation of church and state and religious pluralism? And some talked about a kind of personal Christendom sort of ideal. The final thing I was struck by wasn't the discussion board, but was the vote on our debate last time, which was really... The Crusades one wasn't especially close, the Chartres Paris one was close, but the really unclose one was the first one. Everyone who voted sympathized with your defense of Hildegard, and, and that struck me as interesting. I don't think they wrote about it on the discussion board, but there's something about mysticism that they found mm -hmm. 
believable or appealing or something. Well, and I think because that touches on sort of the... It's another version of a very personal kind of faith, right? Yeah. Because it's this direct experience, right? And I think I actually think there are lots of strains of Protestant Christianity that aren't mystical, but they they definitely do think in terms of not just personal relationship, but really this personal interaction, even, right? And I think there's elements of Hildegard that 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 are sort of attractive there. Now, one thing that I saw in one of the more interesting posts that I had was a student who talked about how something like Christendom, right, something like the medieval worldview really leans towards prayer being a communal thing. Yeah. Where 21st century America especially, right, you know, very individualistic and prayer becomes very individual, personal relationship becomes very individual. And she made a really great point, which was, if I was praying with a group of people, I would pray very different prayers than if I was praying by myself. That's great. And I thought, that's, that's fascinating. So like, so, so what we maybe need to do is try to strike a kind of balance to say that sometimes this is about me and God. Sometimes this is about us and God. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I think that was really interesting because what I was reading and what she wrote is that there's this pendulum and we really sort of have swung to the, you know, and even the language of personal relationship tends to swing to like, this is about me and God, which it is, mm -hmm. but it's also about this, you know, larger, this larger thing. The final thing here is, I mean, as we get to the end of Unit 2 or on the precipice of Unit 3, is it makes me wonder how suspicious her students will be of this modern age we're about to enter, which does promote a kind of individualistic view of we're all these autonomous, self-governing individuals who do whatever we want as long as it doesn't harm others, and, you know, a deeply rational kind of age that's hugely suspicious of people like... Hildegard, but almost everyone we've talked about because they have a different kind of standard for how we know what is true and what is false. Before we get there, though, we've got to go through the Reformation. So that's been the most recent topic with the Renaissance. So what we thought we'd do here is uh, spend a little bit of time looking at the two big Luther readings that you've had in your reading packet and that we've talked about in different ways. So first of all, Sam, I want to ask you, I think one of your favorite readings in CWC is Preface to Romans, mm -hmm. which... I mean, I, I remember being struck by it when I first got here. I thought, well, they'll probably do like Freedom of a Christian or some of Luther's other, like the works of 1520 that really launched the Reformation. And instead, you've got this introduction to the Book of Romans. So sell me on this. Why are you such a fan of Preface to Romans? Right. And, and I want to say, what I'm really a fan of is I'm a fan of it in this course, in this context, and, and what it means as a historical text, right? Um, one of the things it points us to is that this is Luther doing what he did for, for it. I mean, he was a Bible scholar, right? And this is, Preface to Romans is a piece of Bible scholarship, right? And, and, and embedded into it, it's a preface. So it's something he's intending you to read before you sit down and read Romans. So embedded in that, he's intending you to read Romans, right? Yeah. So there's all these interesting layers there, right? Of sort of why does he write this? What is he preparing you for? Why is he preparing you for that? But also embedded in that is really, I think, the keys to a way to think about Luther's theology, right? So if we're, if we're looking at this as a piece of biblical scholarship, he's paying a lot of attention to vocabulary, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is essentially an essay on vocabulary. You know, he's saying, think about these terms, um, law, sin, grace, faith, righteousness, flesh, spirit, right? These are words, and he says, these are words that Paul uses throughout Romans. And when you take a look at that reading, think about Luther saying, here's kind of how this term grace has been understood by medievals. He's going to say misunderstood, yeah. right? So you also have to put those lenses on. This is how Luther yeah, is saying. Is, yeah, right. so th I mean, there, this is definitely, <clears throat> you know, him trying to make an argument, right? Mm -hmm. So he's saying, here's how this has been spoken about before. Here's how it's been misunderstood. And then here's how I think we should think about this. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of Renaissance ad fontes here. Let's think about the language. What do these words mean, right? And what's cool is you start to piece together these terms redefined. And what he's laying out to you is really... Here's the theological revolution that comes from Luther, and it grows out of biblical scholarship. I mean, that, that, so you see him as a Bible professor, like mm -hmm. all the people who would be, you know, a floor above us, right? Just working through the text, and what he's uncovering is really this radical rethinking, you know, compared to the medieval mind of understanding that. And and what's really interesting then is to go and actually read Paul's letter to Romans and read it twice, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you're busy because we're in the middle of this course, but once a course is over, do this sometime. Read Romans and read it with what Luther says the medieval definitions are. And it's a pretty coherent text. Yep. And you can start to get a sense of like, well, I can understand how a medieval person would read this. And then read it with Luther's definitions. And you realize the chasm between those two points of view. I think it's a fascinating text that way. And then as, as one other side point, one of my favorite historical Christians is John Wesley. And John Wesley has his sort of pietistic conversion while listening to someone read this text out loud, right? and Not Romans, but the preface. Re reading Luther's yeah. preface to yeah. Romans out loud, right? And I just, 
And I, so I always read that thinking like, this is really a powerful thing because it changed Wesley's heart. Mm -hmm. It changed Wesley's life. Or it was while listening to this that God changed Wesley's heart. Oh, and then Wesley changed the world in lots and lots of yeah. ways. Like it is a really important text. Yeah. Let me just take on one quick thought here, which is that this also though suggests why things are a little bit more complicated than Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura would be just give them the Book of Romans right. in a language they understand. Instead, you had a preface you're supposed to read, so there's a degree of filter or maybe even control there. Right, I mean, and I think if, if we're talking about the layers it points out yeah. about Luther, it also points out that Luther thought he was right. Yeah. You know, and he's saying, yes, you should read this yourself, but you should read this the way I read well, it. Well, that he's right, and that he's worried that there is something dangerous about Scripture. Like, yes. It, I mean, it's, you know, Romans is complicated, and if you unleash it on a uh, population that's never read it before, mm -hmm. they might take it the wrong way, and right. that's and so, hence, there is a distinction between the Anabaptists, who really do believe Scripture alone, you know, maybe is right in community, but you don't need the guidance of the past or of a theologian or a biblical scholar in order to read it. We can all read it ourselves. So there's even a split. Then we have this second reading from Luther, which is one of your favorites. I mean, this is whenever we have conversations, this is the one you always push, like mm -hmm. preface to or not preface to Romans. Uh, uh, secular authority is really the, the the essential Luther text we need to be reading. And, and so why? So I I mean, first of all, because the, the largest theme in this course is how do Christians relate to any culture? We just happen to be in the West. But really, I mean, I think a lot of this holds true for any culture. And I like that. I like complicated answers. I, I mean, it's a real problem. I think sometimes I overthink things, but Luther does not give us an easy answer to this question. It's not, well, culture is part of God's good creation, so we should affirm it. Maybe we can even build something like Christendom. Like, it's that's not going to work. You can't govern the world by the gospel. I mean, there's barely one in 1,000 who are true Christians, and the Christian is never going to be a good prince. I mean, Luther actually says, you're probably better off having like a Muslim as a prince than a, than a Christian. But he also doesn't say, but reject the world, right? That, that, that doesn't work either. I mean, it actually, if you have the gifts to serve in politics or law or even the military, for the sake of your neighbor, you ought to use those. And so you're left straddling these two things or living in tension between these, these two things. And that tends to feel kind of right. I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than, than Luther, that through small steps, maybe the world doesn't always forever have to be this Pretty wretched, terrible, dangerous. Place. Right. Well, and I would say, I mean, he's he's different than someone like Calvin, who's a yeah. transformer, or yeah. King, who's a transformer. But I think Luther is saying we can make it a little better. Like, so it's, he's not saying that he's not saying we can change it or transform it, but but he's saying that's part of what we need to do is make this as good as it can. But as good as it can is a pretty low bar. Well, what he's saying is we can we can endure it. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's a and make August, it endurable. Yeah. I mean, if you read that and you thought, wow, that sounds a lot like Augustine, the two cities, it makes sense. It's a very Augustinian response, and it's to say we, we kind of are inextricably bound up with this world. You can't just pull yourself out of it. And you know, maybe earthly peace is a pretty good thing. And so if we need to keep that by just war, if we need to keep that by locking people up or executing murderers, well, that's what we're gonna have to do. But what he's also saying is that doing that does not make a government Christian or a legal system Christian or a nation Christian. And you know, as long as I've been at Bethel, there have been students who love to say that this is a Christian nation. And, you know, there, there are a lot of people who would agree with them throughout history. And I always say you need to read on secular authority. If you can get to the end of that, you're either going to have to say, um, you know, Luther is wrong because he clearly doesn't think you can make a Christian nation. Or you might change your mind and decide, well, I can serve in politics or law. But really, at a certain level, this cannot be a gospel-shaped country. That just is not how the world um, is going to work. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a great it is a great letter to 20, 21st century America. Yeah. And, and it's not that he's always right, too. I mean, right. in, like in European history, German Lutherans take it so far that they tend not to speak out against injustice. So that there's a reason why German Lutherans don't speak out in the Third Reich very much, you know, because they basically say, well, that's... That's for the state, mm -hmm. you know, and the state seems to be behaving pretty atrociously against our Jewish population. But the world's but full of devils, right? That's so, what the world yeah. is like, and you can't govern it. So, Sam, one uh, tradition, we're pushing forward in time here into the 17th and 18th century, but it's really important, I think. Uh, one tradition we don't do in a lot of depth is pietism. So this comes out of a kind of later renewal within Lutheranism and, and Reformed Protestantism. Um, you don't have to do a lot with it in this course. You didn't have to in the museum assignments. It's not a vocab term. We don't require you to do a reading, but it is, I think, pretty important to Bethel. Um, so, for example, the new Bethel magazine just came out, and I got to write an article about why pietism really helped shape our vision of you know, who Bethel was, but who it's going to become. So, Sam, as someone who has been at Bethel both as a student 
and as a professor for a long time, what, what does pietism come to mean to you about this place, yourself, whatever you want to say? Right. Well, I mean, at its core to me, pietism is a, um, an expression of Christianity that is rooted in the heart and experience more than it's rooted in doctrine or dogma. I mean, so uh, G.W. Carlson, who was my advisor when I was a student here, I mean, he always talked about how pietists and Baptists are non-creedal, right? So we don't have creeds. There's not, that's not the test of your, of like your faith. It's not, do you assent to this creed or that creed? But it's, it really is about your experience. How does Christ work in your life? How has Christ transformed your life? Um, which I mean, I didn't. I didn't grow up in in a Baptist tradition. I didn't grow up in a Pietist tradition at all. I grew up in the Catholic Church. And when I came to Bethel as a student, I really kind of struggled to figure out. I mean, I've been going to Protestant churches for a while, along with the Catholic Mass throughout high school, and I really struggled to sort of find a, an expression within Protestantism that I felt comfortable with. I felt like I could assent to things. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I understand that, and it was interesting to learn about it. But the thing that, that touched me about pietism is it really was about that experience. And it, and it didn't put a premium on saying, you know, can, are, can you agree with these five doctrines? But it's about, like, how is your life transformed? How do you feel God? Um, and, and as I've taught here over the years, like that, I mean, for me, Christianity, I mean, I would probably lower it from the heart to the gut. But there's something yeah. about, like, yeah. like I, um, that, that's the thing that, that sort of moves me the most, that feels the most real to me. And it allows me, the other thing that it allows me to do is it allows me to say, when there's a tough theological question, to say the premium's not on me having an answer, not on me saying, here's what this means, here's the part in scripture where they talk about it, here's the answer. But there is sort of, a, there, there's a part of it that's like, well, what feels right and just, and how does that align with scripture? So scripture's a part of that, right? But the, 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 there's that, and there's also the freedom to say, you know, I don't know, but the premium isn't on, on me giving an answer. The premium, premium is on how do I imitate Christ in my life? How do I respond to that situation in love, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that's, those are the things that I, that, those are the elements of pietism that attract me most of all. Yeah, I've got a sabbatical coming up next year, and I think one of the projects I'll be doing is writing kind of a, a book for a general audience on why pietism I think is valuable and why I've responded very similarly. I, I did grow up in a pietist church, the, the Covenant Church, which you know, is a pretty explicitly pietistic denomination, but, you know, I mean, one of the churches I went to was a little bit more fundamentalist in some ways, and I went to the East Coast and the South, and I was in Baptist churches, and I came back, and it was really refreshing to get what you just described. So as I thought about that book, I'm, I'm trying to think, like, how do I define pietism, which is a really tricky thing to do. And, and I've kind of thought that, well, there's certain instincts. You know, like, it's almost pre-rational, but it's like if you encounter a situation or a church or an issue, like, you might respond with one of these instincts. And the first that I've come up with is that pietists believe in a God of the prepositions more than the propositions. You know, often Christians, I think, have the tendency to reduce God to intellectual propositions. He is Trinity. He was incarnate. He will come again. And that's all true. And there is biblical authority for all those things. And we capture it in creeds and confessions. And we pay theologians to think about it. And all that's well and good. But I think before that, you know, what's in some ways deeper and more important is the fact that, that Christ, Jesus Christ is God with us. And we have life in Christ and we strive to be like Christ, and we strive towards him as our only appropriate goal. And so that relationship that we capture through things called prepositions really captures more what's at the heart of Christian life, is the experience of a God who is personal and who is relational. And it's not to say you shouldn't spend time thinking about the nature of that, and not every Lord is Christ, and not every thing is a good model that's Christ-like, but I think that you've got to have that or else it's not really authentic. Okay, very briefly, we're coming up to the second of our three exams. So, um, Sam, I'm going to turn to you. I've kind of, kind of hijacked this You're question. You're hosting today. Yes. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for students? Uh, we, we've talked a lot about exams in the first couple of episodes, so I don't think, you know, I think you know, in some ways go back to those, but what maybe final words? Just advice? looking at the first exam, uh, get materials ready. Think about things in terms of examples and readings. I mean, those are the, those are the two things that would make um, – that would make the essay a lot stronger. And then think about connections beyond similarities, right? Like like how do things impact or affect other things, not just these two things are alike. Okay.
Um, otherwise, I don't think I have a lot to add. I mean, I think time management, you know, it, it continues to always be an issue. A lot of my students did really well with it. If you didn't, you know, you'd maybe even go back. I don't know if you can find a time stamp on Moodle, but if you have some sense of how long it took you to write the essay especially, you might want to think about, like, at least the sequence. Do you start with that? Do you try to get some shorter things done quickly? But, you know, pay a little bit of attention uh, before you take the test. Welcome back to segment two of PTI. Today we're going to be playing our second round of Food Chain. We're going to be ranking the top five most important figures from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the Reformation era. So I'm going to go first, and then Chris is going to go second. So my number five pick is the Renaissance man, Michelangelo. So I'm putting Michelangelo on here because I think he embodies the Renaissance. If we're going to, if we're going to take the Renaissance seriously as, um, as a time period that we're looking at, I think it's really important that we have one of these artists up here uh, because they really do sort of shape the kind of uh, shift in that we see in in humanity and sort of how we th how people think about um, human potential, human ability. Uh, Mich Michelangelo really stands as a symbol of all of that. Um, and I think you know we often talk about people who are theologians or political leaders, things like that. But there are as many ideas and sort of cultural ideas and cultural values embedded in the works of Michelangelo as we're going to find in any of the philosophers that we look at. So I think he's a really important uh, important figure to put on this list. At number four, I'm putting Benedict of Nursia. As we talked about in segment one, um, monasticism, especially Benedictine monasticism, is plays such an important role in helping to stabilize um, Western Europe, stabilized medieval Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, Benedict creates one of the essential institutions for the Middle Ages and really even beyond that. So I think to not have him on this list um, just doesn't work, right? I think that, that, that the, the monasteries, the communal form of monasticism that he puts together is just is essential for thinking about um, sort of the medieval understanding of faith and the role that the church is going to play um, throughout the Middle Ages. At number three, I have the Protestant reformer Martin Luther, right? I think the Protestant Reformation is really important as we're looking at this medieval Renaissance and Reformation time period. If you're going to put one reformer up there, um, I think Luther's the, the person that has to be there. Now, the reason I didn't put Luther number one, because I think um, he's, he, if we asked a lot of people, I think Luther would be the person that they would put at the top of this list, um, is that although Luther's ideas are very important and the Reformation that he begins is very important, I'm not necessarily certain that if there hadn't been a Luther that that, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have a Zwingli or we wouldn't have a Calvin or people like that. I think some of these reforming ideas were in the air, right? And I think Luther is someone who's in the right place at the right time. He's a, a man of sort of monumental intellect, monumental ideas, but I think that he was somebody who was sort of in that right place at that right time. So he's very important, but there's a couple people that I want to put ahead of him on this list. Number two, I put Muhammad, right? Muhammad is the, the, the sort of first adherence to a major world religion, right? So we can find the beginnings of Islam um, with Muhammad. And, uh, you know, a lot of what, we're, what we see in our world today th um, in America is connected with sort of how we think about, um, start to think about this interreligious dialogue between Christians and Muslims and things like that. And, and we see the roots of some of that and some of that tension going all the way back to the Middle Ages and things like the Crusades. Um, I think Muhammad is, is, he couldn't be more important in terms of shaping a religion that millions and millions and millions of people um, are adherents to. So he goes number two on my list. And then number one on my list is the medieval philosopher, scholastic philosopher Thomas Aquinas. And the reason I put Aquinas up there is because he's kind of sort of is the apex of the medieval mind, right? If we think about um, the Middle Ages, we think about triangles a lot, we think about pyramids a lot, hierarchies. Right? Another way to think about that is we're all sort of moving to a point, we're moving to the intellect of Thomas Aquinas, the ideas of Thomas Aquinas. They're really important to the Catholic Church even to this day, but he really gives us a snapshot of not just medieval life and medieval culture, but medieval mind. Right? What is the extent to which we can think about that sort of hierarchical worldview, that great chain of being worldview, also tied in with thinking, you know, having really powerful thoughts about faith and reason, how we understand that, and how we use that hierarchical um, worldview to think about our relationship to God. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. <clears throat> okay. Uh, it's a good list. Not surprisingly, because Sam did it. I, I have 
Only two people, though, on mine, which I think underscores this was a really difficult set to go through. It's, it's a big chunk of time. There are a lot of big ideas, a lot of disparate things happening. Number one on Sam's list doesn't even make my top five. So let's get right to it. I'm going to start with Hildegard Bingen. Uh, a few things here. Uh, number one, <clears throat> I can make the same mistake twice. I, I learned my lesson losing overwhelmingly when I, when I essentially uh, demeaned her visions last time. And I, I do think they're important. They do point to an important tradition within Christianity. They're, you really can't understand medieval Christianity without understanding mysticism. Number two, as we've talked about before, we've really got a paucity of women as, as named figures in this course because they're kept silent. These are paternalistic society, uh, patriarchal societies. This is a woman who was listened to, and not just in religion, but in politics, and music, and medicine. And number three, she has a bullet behind her. Before he left the papacy, Pope Benedict actually named Hildegard a doctor of the church, which is the kind of position reserved for Augustine or for Thomas Aquinas. So I'd say you're going to hear more from this Hildegard in the, in the years to come. <clears throat> number four, I'll put Muhammad on the list. Uh, all the same reasons that Sam enunciated out. I guess I don't place him quite as high for a course about Western culture and about Christianity, but undoubtedly important. I remember back in social studies, in, I think it was high school, we looked at this book called The 100, which was someone's attempt to rank the 100 most important individuals in history. I was always struck that Jesus was number three, I think. Isaac Newton was number two. Muhammad was actually number one on that list because he has such a, uh, you know, for better and for worse, important role in human history. Okay, number three, I had Machiavelli. Um, this is actually a term a couple of my students struggled with. Um, they, they got the sense of why he's a Renaissance humanist, that he looks back to the Romans, that he has this uh, sense of the potential that humans, or at least some humans, have. What a couple missed, though, is the fact that this is a key figure in the secularization of the West. Throughout the Middle Ages, throughout all of uh, Unit 2, it's really hard to tell the difference between Christianity and Western culture. They're synonymous. Synonymous, but Machiavelli is starting to pull them apart. He's suggesting that to be a good leader, you maybe shouldn't be too Christian. That actually, while you might need to seem religious, um, to maintain power and preserve it, you probably will have to violate Christian or any other kind of ethics. And it's pointing us towards a more secular modern age in which uh, there might be different ways of thinking about um, what is the good life, what does flourishing look like, that are totally separated from any kind of Christian ethic. And so you'll see even more of the importance of this once we get to the modern age. <clears throat> Number two is Johannes Gutenberg. Now we're cheating a little bit here because Gutenberg himself is not a mastery term, but the printing press that he and others uh, in German guilds in the mid 15th century invented is obviously important. And this is the kind of thing sometimes we overlook in this course. I, yeah, as long as I've been teaching it, I feel like the weakness has been we don't do a whole lot with things like social history and economic history, history of technology. We tend to gravitate more towards biggest stories, you know, uh, individuals. This totally reshapes uh, not just technology, but all the effects that stem from it, communication, education, how ideas are transferred. It's going to make him possible in a way that otherwise he would have been not nearly as significant a figure. Um, I think the only thing to liken it to is, is the revolution we're going through now with the internet. I mean, as, as, as world-changing as it feels now that we've got this digitization going on, that's how people felt in the wake of what Gutenberg did with movable type in the printing press. Now, all that said, I've got Martin Luther at the top of my list because I fundamentally disagree with what Sam said. I, I think all these ideas were in the air. You've got the technology to make possible the dissemination of those ideas. I do tend to be the kind of historian who thinks that individuals have important roles to play and that we should just assume that had you, you pull this name out, it kind of would have worked anyway. Zwingli would have done the same thing or Calvin would have come along and done the same thing. I, I think that this individual's personality Again, as with Muhammad, as with any of these, for better or worse, is imprinted on Christian and Western history. And um, in many ways, he's a pivotal figure, a hinge figure, we sometimes call him. He's the last medieval in some ways. I mean, he never does lose that kind of appreciation for medieval spirituality and worship, and certainly not for medieval hierarchies and politics and society and economy. But he's also the first modern, the, the first uh, these Western Christians to say, here I stand, individual. Uh, my conscience, my conscience uh, is, is captive to the word of God. I can do no other. That's a very modern kind of statement. And we kind of live in that world. I mean, how many times do we expect to have to stand for our conscience, to stand against what hierarchies are telling us? 
Luther is in many ways pioneering that, or at least giving us the first kind of famous story of that. So, Sam, one thing that I think struck both of us as we compared our lists is the, the snub. We're in baseball all-star season, we're talking right. about snubs. Who have we snubbed on this? Well, this I will exercise? say that the, the last person on my list was Erasmus. Um, and the reason I didn't put him on, he's one of my favorite people. I think he's unbelievably important. But I also think he's somebody who sort of is forgotten to history in yeah. lots and lots of ways. So as much as I want to put him on there, as I look at, at the sort of murderer's row of people we have up here, it's hard to say, well, Erasmus really is, is in that same ballpark. Yeah, I think if the game were the most the five most important individuals for CWC faculty members, past and present, Erasmus is on. I mean, there's a reason the movie you just watched is really about Luther and Erasmus. But I will say, you know, when I came here, I had hardly ever encountered Erasmus, and I studied European history in graduate school. I, I knew him more because there's a program in European universities called the Erasmus program. It has nothing to do with faith at all. Did you have a, a sixth person on your list? I mean, I, looking at these, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing that we have the word medieval up here, and I don't have Thomas Aquinas. That's well, kind of shocking. And I would say, I mean, that, that's my one criticism of your list, which is three of these people exist within the last 150 years of this time. It period. is, yeah. It's you know, so, so as I was thinking about this, I, I really wanted to lean towards the medieval, you know, that we, we have some essential people from the Renaissance and Reformation, but I, I think this actually speaks to, to some of the historical bias that sometimes happens, yep. which is we look at... We, we want to skip over the Middle Ages to a yeah. certain degree. Yeah. You know? no, it's, I mean, much as I personally don't love the Renaissance, I think I share its kind of antipathy in some ways for the Middle Ages. I would say, though, that actually Erasmus is tied with someone else. I think Francis of Assisi was the last one I swapped out, who's a you know, very much medieval figure, but to me underscores the complexity of the Middle Ages, that um, as deeply as he drinks at the wells of medieval spirituality, and he's very much part of that church, he also exists as a rebuff to the excesses of that of a hierarchy that Aquinas really serves and he's bound up with. You know, Francis, um, I'll put it this way, I remember when I talked to my brother-in-law when he was going through a Western Civ class in his college, I said, where are you all this stuff on Augustine and Aquinas? He said, well, why, like, why aren't you doing like Francis of Assisi? That was actually the hinge figure for that class because that was such a central and really uh, convicting example of Christian discipleship. So I mean, my big takeaway from, from this conversation is Students, these are all really important people, but if there's two people that you should dive deeper into, I really think it's Erasmus and Francis. Yeah. I actually think they, they speak to um, 21st century tensions. They speak to historical tensions really, really well. They're, they're living at really unique periods of time, and they're responding to them. So if this is a course about Christians responding to the culture around them, I think those are two, uh, two voices that I wish echoed more through time. Can I name a third? Can sure. Menno Simons. I mean, if you did not spend a lot of time in the Anabaptist wing of the museum, I think, I remember coming here and thinking, why are we spending time on the Anabaptists? And now I think that that's a really important moment in the course, because it's such a small segment of the Christian population. But again, like Francis, it's such a distinctive kind of model of discipleship that kind of flows against our natural instincts to seek lives of convenience and comfort. Instead, it's, it's a really radical form of discipleship. So now the ball is in your court. Go to the website and vote. Whose list do you think better represents the most important figures of the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and Reformation? Time for happy happies. Happy birthday to, these are all posthumous, but somewhat miraculously or coincidentally, Ernest Hemingway in 18, 1899, Don Knotts in 1924, and Senator Paul Wellstone in 1944 all share a birthday. Sam, you love vocab connections. Take us through the web. What connects these three seemingly disparate individuals? I, you know, I, you, you wanted this to be hard. I did. I don't know if you're going to like my answer, but... Probably not. Now, my answer is not that they're all American, yeah, because that's too easy, easy right? Yeah. But yeah. The, to me, it, it's more they all touch on essential core, core pieces of Americana, oh, okay, right? So, good. like, so, so Hemingway, I remember um, listening to, I think it was uh, the writer Robert Creamer talking about um, in the 1930s, in, or, yeah, the 1930s and 40s, the U.S. had this sort of regal dynasty of you had Hemingway, you know, in Africa on safari, you had um, FDR in the White House, and you had Joe DiMaggio in center field for the Yankees, right? So, so there, there's, that sort of speaks to a kind of Americana. Don Knotts, right? He's, he's, um, he's uh, on the Andy Griffith show, right? Um, so Barney Fife is this sort of classic Americana character within a classic Americana show, right? And then he goes on to Three's Company and plays Mr. Furley, also a slice of 1970s Americana, right? Sure, sure. And then Paul Wellstone, to me, speaks to sort of the... Um, what was interesting as I was growing up was the sort of 1960s and 70s um, countercultural liberal moving into you know, in the mainstream and being yep. a U.S. senator, right? And, which, is, which is this shift that we see happen as we move from... 
um, adolescence and young adults to sort of middle age, right? So, which is, which I think is this sort of uh, classic transition, which I don't know if it's particularly American, but it seems like there's something at the core of, of Americanness or Americana. That so that that would be my connection. Again, I don't know if you like that. Connection. That's great. That's that's so much better than anything. I I was I was going to double check how tall they were. I couldn't remember <laughs> if Hemingway was a tall guy or not. I think he was probably about okay. six foot. Would be my well, guess. All right, happy, happy anniversary, Chris and his wife Katie, who celebrate number nine today. Mm -hmm. Chris, any plans? We do have plans. We are going to. I think it's called Sinai San Lek. It's a nice Thai restaurant in Northeast. And then we're going to the Music Man at the Guthrie. We've got this. I think like three or four year tradition. Of going to see whatever the summer musical is at the Guthrie, and my wife is actually from um, very near the town in Iowa that the the play is based on. So we're going to go see the music. If there. I can make one recommendation Please. to just like put a capper on the evening, yeah. I call it a frujertwinix. <laughs> She'll love it. Well, there is half of it left. Maybe I can just wrap it up and that's right. Bring it along. <laughs> okay, and happy trails to maybe Donald Trump's 2016 presidential hopes. Of course. Uh, Mr. Trump insulted Republican Senator John McCain, the highly decorated Vietnam War POW, saying, quote, I like people who weren't captured. And then on Sunday, refused to apologize and kind of doubled down on the insult. Sam, I think the field just got slightly less crowded. Are you ready to announce your candidacy for the presidency of the United States of America? It's pretty interesting because I'm actually now old enough. I'm 38, so like I could I could actually run for president. I was lucky um, for President Obama that four years ago you weren't. That's right. Otherwise. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say, you know. What's um, your platform? I will not seek nor accept the oh. nomination, right? If nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Okay. Do you have any predictions? Can no, I, it's okay. way too early. Uh, here, okay, here's actually my prediction. This yeah. is why I'm excited Break about this field. Chris. I was alive in 1988, Chris. Some of our students probably weren't. Maybe probably not. many of our students probably weren't. 1988 was a great year for Saturday Night Live just because <laughs> they could do so many sketches that had like big casts, yep. you know, the whole cast playing different people running for president. So I'm hoping we're going to get a fun year of, uh, of election well, SNL. I, I think just to do like the Republican feel, like every cast member needs to do like three. It'll be like SNL 40 again. Like uh, everybody will have to come back. Okay, well, that's the end of this episode. Uh, as always, we invite email your thoughts about Food Chain, certainly your vote about who won Food Chain. I think I have some ground to make up here in the uh, course line competition. Your thoughts about the presidential field, about the Benedict option, about uh, whatever else is on your mind. And uh, otherwise, just uh, best wishes as you study for the test and then enjoy the day off after it before we commence the very short unit three that ends the course. I think that's it, Sam. All right. Say goodnight, Stacey. Good